And now let me introduce Tracy Johnson with 10 keys for turning good shows into great shows. Tracy Johnson. Thank you. First of all, I want to really thank all of you for being here. Uh, I know it's a difficult year to do anything, to go, do, go places, to gather. A lot of challenges to overcome from budget to concerns about the pandemic to just getting back into the rhythm of being at boot camp again. And I admire all of you for being here. Thank you. And thank you, Don, for bringing back Morning Show Boot Camp this year. Uh, and I hope all of you newbies, I, all of you newbies who are here for the first time, I hope you're inspired and that you have something to take away that you can take back to your stations and fuel your growth for the next 365 days before Morning Show Boot Camp next year. When Don uh, and I were talking a few months ago about uh, what this presentation would be like, he said, well, I want you to give them some keys that they can take back and start using on their show immediately uh, on Monday morning. How you can you do 10 keys to take your show from good to great. So we're starting with an assumption. We're starting with the assumption that your show is already good. <laughs> so assuming that you're already good, what are you going to do to be great? Now, I've got about 45 minutes to go through this, and there's 10 things, which means I have four and a half minutes to dig into each of these 10 points in great depth and detail so you can take it back and execute it all. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, and we'll leave some time at the end for some questions and answers. And if you have any questions you'd like me to go a little bit deeper on, I will be happy to do so. 10 things to take you from good to great. Now, why 10, and how, how easy is this to execute? Well. Think of this phrase, 10 in 10. An extra 10% effort in 10 different categories is all it takes to put you over the top. That's the big difference. If you're uh, baseball fans and you know anything about the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, there's a uh, great book about the uh, Devil Rays, or the, they're the Rays now, they're not the Devil Rays, but the Rays method and, their, and the, the Rays way is giving an extra 2% effort that gives them the edge over other teams. So what if you could give an extra 10% effort to give you the edge over other shows and over other media? I'm gonna break it down into three different categories, starting with content. So the first few are about content. Number one is make every break sparkle. Every single break. Because listeners are drawing their only impression of you on very short listening occasions. They don't listen very long. Most of them are listening for about seven minutes at a time for two or three quarter hours per morning. That's not much time to make an impression. So those first impressions are important. Even that first break at 5.30 in the morning, which is your first break of the day, and you're just warming up, and you're saying hello, and kind of mailing it in, talking about what you had for dinner last night, going around the room and asking, hey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. How are you today? That's your warm up. That's not what the listener's expecting. They turn on the radio expecting to be entertained for their seven minute period two or three times per morning. Even that first break and that last break. You know, when the, uh, the bulk of the show's over, you're through that seven o'clock hour and you're saying, well, we're just going into middays now. We're going into a lot of music here. So uh, we'll just say goodbye and we'll just kind of wing it here. You can't afford to wing it anymore. This is how fans are won. Fans come, uh, come on board when you bring it every time you turn on the mic. Uh, Joe DiMaggio, I keep using baseball analogies. It's uh, kind of my passion. It's kind of my thing. Uh, Joe DiMaggio, great player for the Yankees in the 40s and 50s, uh, was known for his hustle and giving it all every game. And a writer asked him one time why he plays so hard all the time. And Joe said... I play my best every day because you never know when someone may be seeing you play for the first time. And I think that applies to radio personalities. Listeners are making their impressions based on whatever's coming through their speakers whenever they choose to tune in. So make every break sparkle. Secondly, curate your content. The most entertaining content is going to be that which you create with your own story. It's not something that you got from a show prep service that somebody in another market did. It's not just regurgitating a list that you picked up online and reading the top five 
the ways that uh, couples are breaking up and then commenting on it. It's curating that content and turning it into a story. This is the way museum curators curate art. They don't just take a great painting and staple it to the wall or duct tape it up there, put some masking tape on it and hope people come and look at this beautiful piece of art. They curate it. They figure out how they're going to display it. What kind of frame are you going to put on it? Where are you going to light it? How, what's the path that you're going to lead their customers through before they see this display? Well, your art is just as important as their art. And you need to curate your art to make it most appealing to your customers, to your audience, to your listeners. So how do you curate? Well, you start with the source. But the source of your content is not your story. The source of your content is just the inspiration for it. Because really, what you're doing is no different than what other shows and other personalities are doing everywhere. The key is that you find a perspective. What's your point of view? What's your perspective? What do you think about this? What inspires you about it? What interests you about it? What's going to stir some passion about it? What do you have something to say about this? And you make your content about that, about how you feel. Not about the source. The source is just where you start. Your story is about how you feel about it. And that's what will separate your content from anyone else's. That's how ideas become unique entertainment. You heard the panel this morning with the uh, VPs of programming. Uh, I heard several of them say at different times that it's all about creating unique entertainment that they can't get anywhere else because other stations can copy your programming. Uh, Spotify is going to play the same Justin Bieber songs that we play. What separates you is the personality. What separates personalities is what you do with your content. It's not just finding the best content to talk about. It's not just finding the topics. It's finding what you do with those uh, topics. And that comes down to preparation. Uh, Tom Brady of the Buccaneers said, if you want to perform at the highest level, you have to, perf you have to prepare at the highest level. And I think most shows are either not preparing enough or not preparing deeply enough to get to this level. We find the things that we want to talk about, we put them on a list, we maybe put them in a show planner. And we say, we're going to do this in this break, we're going to talk about this in that break. And when you come to that break, they haven't thought about how they're going to talk about it or where it's going to go from there. Preparation requires getting to that deeper level and getting content. And then the third thing under content is, what else? Um, how are, will, what will you do that will make this piece of content stand out? that will cause listeners to talk about you, to be part of the conversation. Not just the ordinary things, not just a good break on the radio, because good breaks on the radio are pretty easy to ignore. I hear them, they're nice, they go, they go past me, but they aren't remarkable. They don't make me talk about you to friends or coworkers. They don't stay with me. Uh, things that are special get retold. So how can we get in listeners' conversations today? What else can we do to put this over the top? What extra 10% can we put into this break that will cause someone who heard it this morning to tell their friends about it, to comment on it, to talk about it with their families, to bring up that, that topic of conversation? Not just, hey, I heard this on the radio today, but did you hear what this show said today? That's what sets you apart. One way of doing that is a digital extension. And I'm not going to go into detail about how you can be, a, uh, be great on social media. That's not what this is about. But there's a lot of times where you can spread your message through digital and social media by either extending what you did on the air to those platforms or starting with those platforms and bringing it on the air. So what will you do that will make listeners say, did you hear what they did on the radio today? Uh, this is uh, Kyle and Jackie O, one of the great uh, radio shows in the world. They're on KISS FM in Sydney, Australia. And Craig Bruce was their executive producer for many years. And he told me that Jackie would obsess in their Monday morning meetings every week and not let anybody leave the meeting. And sometimes they'd be there for hours because she wouldn't leave that meeting until they came up with an idea that she felt would cause someone in the media 
to talk about them, cover their story, cover their show, ask for an interview, and talk about them sometime that week. They were driven by that. They were obsessed about it. So how do you find ways to cause the audience to talk? Now I'm going to give you a couple of tips on uh, performance. Uh, ways to take your show from good to great through performance. Number one, number seven overall as we do the countdown. Uh, number one is to simplify. Listeners aren't going to work that hard to pay attention to your show. Sorry, but they're not. Radio is basically a background medium. Uh, nobody says, hey, you know what? It's 7 o'clock. It's time to listen to the radio. Let's find a program to listen to. Oh, it's 7 o'clock. That's the time I always listen to this. They don't do that. They don't listen that way. It's not like television. It's not like watching a movie where they make an appointment with it. It's not like going to a theater. It's not even like listening to a podcast where they seek it out and make a decision to do it. Radio's usually along for the ride and we're in the background. And that presents some really complicated and difficult challenges for us as a medium. Listeners are mega confused, and it's not because they're stupid. Well, some of them are. But it's not because, it's not because they're dumb, it's because they're not paying much attention. Because it's not that important to them. They're multitasking. And so a lot of things that we take for granted and think it's simple, like giving the phone number, or mentioning the call letters, or the positioning statement, or telling them what that song was, or what we have coming up, or even your names, they don't hear it. Because we make it too complicated. We don't make it obvious enough. So talk to them like they're third graders. Explain it. Explain that contest. Explain that promotion. Explain what you want them to do and when you want them to do it. Explain how you want them to participate with your show, whether it's by text or by phone call or however you want them to interact. And take the time to do it because they're not paying that much attention. And when you do it, appeal to their emotions, starting with a listener benefit, not with your interest. It's not what we want, it's what you get. And if you start talking to them in those terms, yeah, yeah, you can't talk to a third grader and tell them why, here's what I want you to do and why I want you to do it. You make it interesting and appealing to them to do what you want them to, and they'll do it. They'll cooperate with you. And listeners are the same way. Here's the challenge that we face. When multiple stimulus compete for attention, we become stressed, and that's when tune-out happens. Now, the brain uh, processes information in channels. So I can be driving down the road, uh, in a familiar road and I can have a conversation with you and the radio on in the background at the same time because all of those things are processed in different channels. Music is processed in a different channel than talk. So I can read a book and I can listen to music and I can multitask that way. It's very compatible. Music's processed in one channel. The book I'm reading is processed in another. I can write a report and listen to music. I can't watch TV and write a report. Because the talk, the conversation, is coming into the same channel as the television program is, or the movie is. And that becomes confusing. And when we become confused, it causes stress. When we are stressed, what do we do? We try to relieve the stress. How do we relieve the stress? We get rid of the thing that we perceive as causing the stress. Well, if I'm already listening to music and doing something in the foreground, Whatever you're doing when you come in and start to talk, you're the one that's causing me stress. So you've got two choices. Number one is you can be important enough to win the attention to be foreground, and they put whatever they were doing in the foreground in the background, and you win, or they will tune you out. They'll turn the radio down, they'll turn the channel, or, and eventually, in a research project, they'll say, DJs talk too much. I hate that station. They all, all they do is talk. They talk all the time. Well, it's not that you're talking all the time. It's the talk that you're doing is causing them to be stressed. And that is associated with a negative feeling, and they don't know how to express that necessarily. Now, that doesn't mean that you talk too much. Because talk is the most... You know, somebody on the panel this morning said that the goal for their stations is that you eventually remove all of the music. That's the goal for every client that I work with, that all the music comes off. 
because that's what's going to make you unique and original and stand out, and that's what's going to get you more foreground when you earn the right to talk that much. But if you do that all at once, it's going to be kind of a, it's going to be kind of a train wreck. So as you turn on the microphone and you're replacing the music, think, what am I going to do here to win the attention, to be foreground, and put whatever that listener was doing in the background? That's the battle that you're facing. Number six, stop being perfect. I want you to go back to your stations on Monday morning and master the art of sucking. I want your show to suck. Uh, now, not all of it, and not really bad, and not all the time. But if you're not trying some things that you're not comfortable with, that stretches you, and gets you into some areas that you've never tried before, you're not growing. If you're doing a good show, it's pretty easy, and it's pretty easy to keep being good. It's not easy to become great, and you don't get great by staying the same. So stop polishing the entertainment value out of your show. Uh, I work with a show who is like this sofa. It's beautiful, but it wasn't very comfortable. They were perfect. I mean, they were flawlessly executed. They were technically perfect, and you know, we'd sit in critique sessions, and um, I, I would say, so what did you think of that break? And they would find the most minute, detailed things. You know, I could have phrased that differently. If I would have changed the first part of that and made that the last part, it would have been better. I'm going, you, you don't get, I, I said, that all might be well and good. I said, I can't find anything that was wrong with your break. The only problem is it wasn't very entertaining because it didn't connect. Nobody wants to sit in that sofa. Can you imagine, imagine sitting in that beautiful sofa that probably costs thousands of dollars and laying down and watching a movie in that sofa? That's not comfortable, is it? That's not what, and listeners want to relate to people, to personalities on the air that either are, you're just like me, you're just like someone that I know, or you're just like someone that I'd really like to hang out with. And that usually isn't a sofa that looks like that. So don't polish the entertainment out of your show, but don't go out of your way to be sloppy or intentionally sucky. We're not trying to be bad. We're just giving you permission that it doesn't have to be perfect. You're not striving for per perfection. You're striving for excellence. And there's a big difference in those things. John Wooden, UCLA basketball coach for many years, said, it takes time to create excellence. If it could be done more quickly more people would do it. And you're seeking excellence, and by the way, that's a pursuit that you'll never get to the end of. Because by the time you think you're there, the bar has changed. And one of the reasons that it's hard to go from a good show to a great show is because a show that you did five years ago, three years ago, one year ago, six months ago, that was great then, it's just good now. There's a new bar for being great, and that's, that bar is constantly being increased. That happens in sports, it happens in music, it happens in, in all forms of entertainment. Everything that, that the, the, the public expects is higher than it's been at any time in the past. It takes more to communicate and to cut through, and to get there, to go from good to great, you have to be imperfect. You have to stretch. Next point is, as you're preparing and producing and performing your content, be loose and tight at the same time. Um, and you can be loose and tight if you prepare more deeply so you can perform more spontaneously. Most shows that I work with are either over-prepared or under-prepared. Over-prepared shows come off sounding rehearsed and scripted, and they've got everything bullet-pointed, and they'll say things like, okay, when I say this, you say that, because that'll take me here, and then I'm going to hit with a punchline, and everybody will laugh. And then they perform it on the air, and it sounds stiff. It sounds like that sofa that I showed you. It sound, it's, it's too tight. Or they're loose. The show that says, okay, we're going to talk about uh, the latest thing that the CDC just said about COVID-19. Okay, what about it? Well, I'm not going to give you any more than that because I want you to have a natural, spontaneous reaction when we talk about it on the air. And how many times do you go through a break like that and you have no idea what's going to be talked about on the air and as soon as the mics go off and the commercials come on, you go, oh, I should have said this. 
Well, it's because you weren't prepared. You had no idea where that was going to go. The key is to prepare tight and perform loose. You can't just wing it, but don't script it. And there's a happy medium there. You want to find what Tina Fey calls relaxed readiness. Now, Tina Fey is known as a spontaneous, improv improvisational performer. A lot of the best moments in her movies and her TV shows came when she ad-libbed. She said something spontaneous that wasn't in the script, it was unexpected. Those are some of the best moments. And she was asked, oh, this, that is actually from her book, which is a great book for radio personalities, by the way, Bossy Pants. Uh, she said, I call it relaxed readiness. There's a lot of preparation. It's preparation, preparation, preparation. And then you want to be in a relaxed state of readiness so that the something spontaneous does happen you're there and can take advantage of that moment. I used Tina Fey because I didn't want to use another sports analogy in here. Um, but it's the same with an NFL quarterback. NFL teams might script the first 20 plays of the football game. But depending on what happens in the first quarter, that plan has to change. And they can change by responding spontaneously to the situation that's put in front of them because they're prepared so deeply for anything that might happen during that game. And I want you to go back and figure out what your relaxed readiness is. What do you need to be so fully prepared that you can respond to anything that's happening? Uh, Scott Smith and Kelly Caldwell are here from K-Love. Uh, the network gets there. Is this your first boot camp? Uh, and they have become really proficient in this area. They do a couple of features every week. Um, one of them is uh, Make a Difference Monday. And they do, uh, what, what's the uh, Friday? It's the uh, Feel Good Friday. And they never really know what's going to happen in those, in those calls. Feel Good Friday might be, is designed to be a celebration. It's going to be happy. It's going to be uh, you know, things that bring listeners up, make them feel good. It's a great way to end the week. Sometimes they'll get a call that makes you cry. But they know how to respond to that because they're so well prepared for it. That's a great example of relaxed readiness. The third category is discipline. Discipline is one of the most important things on the air. Um, be more efficient. Now, discipline isn't about shortening your breaks. Discipline is not about short breaks. It's about not wasting the listener's time. And efficiency means I'm not going to take seven minutes to say something that I should say in two, but at the same time, I'm not going to try to say it in two if I need seven. It's being efficient with the time that you have. Uh, nobody ever complains that a movie is too short or the church service is too short or the book is too short. They usually complain if those things are too long and they aren't worthy of the time that they take up. But I've also never heard anybody say a great classic movie that went three and a half hours was too long. It's all about whether it's worth the amount of time that we're asking the consumer to invest in it. And efficient performance, um, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour here, um, is about connecting with the audience. Now, over the past few years, you've probably heard a lot of people like me, talent coaches and program directors who have read the studies about uh, audience attention and how attentions are shorter than they've ever been before. And we have eight seconds to get their attention or they're never going to listen, they're, they're going to tune out. And I've heard a lot of shows and a lot of programmers who have, I've come to realize, misapply what that means in performance. Uh, so I hear a lot of shows where the song will be fading out and they'll come on, bam, and just hit you over the head with the first line of whatever it is they were going to say. And it's kind of like being at a cocktail party and these five wonderful people are all in a group having a drink and laughing and having a good time. And you walk up, a total stranger, and instead of introducing yourself, you walk up and say, let me tell you about what happened to me last night. And they're going like, you are, are you nuts? You've just punched them in the face, metaphorically. On the other hand, if you walk up to these people and you come in and you just chit chat and you take a long time and you don't get any, anywhere, they all start making up excuses to go somewhere else and get into another group. 
handshakes are really important. Uh, so you want to avoid chit chat, but acknowledge the environment. Connect with the listener based on whatever it is that they were listening to. Acknowledge that environment. Acknowledge the song that was playing. Match the mood. Uh, introduce yourself. Take a couple of seconds. And I've started working, you know, changing the phrasing that I use with my shows where instead of you've got seven seconds to win their attention, you've got seven seconds not to lose their attention. And that might help you relax a little bit as you start into that break. And I think that's really important. I mean, think if you were watching television and uh, you have no idea what you want to watch. You wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going to start flipping through channels. You don't have an appointment, you don't know what you're going to watch, and you click on a show, how long do you give it? Probably not very long, probably like half a second, and you go on to the next thing. But then something captures your attention, and you go, oh, I want to check this out. They probably have 8 or 10 seconds not to lose your attention to keep you there and watch a little bit longer. So don't lose the attention that first eight seconds and by, by having too much chit-chat, but shake their hand. Don't punch them in the face. Number three, as we count down to number one, uh, stop reading text messages, mostly. I'm not saying don't use text messaging. I know that's how most people are communicating now, much more so than phone calls. So and I think text messaging is a terrific tool to use to help you entertain, to engage and interact with the audience. But this is an audio medium, and we need to perform accordingly. And I think there's a lot of shows that have said, well, listeners are communicating more by text, so we'll just read text because that's how they want to communicate. It's not very entertaining to hear someone come on the air and read a bunch of things someone else has written. So there's a lot of things you can do with it. Uh, number one, listeners respond by the example that you set. You want phone calls? Put phone calls on. You get a great text? Text them back and say, hey, can we call you and put you on the air? A lot of them will say no. They don't want to be bothered. They don't have the time. They don't want to be on the air. But the ones who do, and you don't need that many phone calls, but find some who will and put their voice on the air because it does two things. It sounds more exciting to a listener. It uh, adds movement, and it gives you a voice to respond to which brings more personality out of your character. Phone calls are better than text messages on the air. So be creative in soliciting your callers. And, uh, oh, uh, shoot, let me go backwards. Um, oh, and also, while I'm at it, I'll add one more that didn't fit into a whole thing. Stop playing videos of audio, the uh, audio of videos that I can't see and responding to what you can see, but I can't. Now, <laughs> it drives listeners crazy. So, oh, look at that. That's crazy. Did you see that? No, I didn't see it. I'm listening to the radio. Only you can see it. So, fine, use that audio, but tell a visual picture uh, along with it. So, my rule of thumb with personalities, if you're going to read text messages, read no more than two before you put on a phone call. And don't start reading text messages unless you get a phone call in there somewhere. So, uh, again, don't not use text, but Put listeners on if you're going to do audience interaction. Number two is learn to tease. Uh, invest time in learning to tease better, then do it more. I've never had a show where I felt they teased too much, ever. And I've got a show that teases 17 times an hour in different forms. It's a matter of doing it properly. So whatever you're doing, you're not teasing too much. Uh, and I'll explain why in a second. Make teasing a part of your show prep. And what's more important, the tease or the content? Let me put this past you. If listeners are tuning in for short periods of time, seven minutes per occasion, and they're listening for two or three breaks per morning, and they listen for two or three days per week, which is all true, you can look it up. Nielsen will give you all that information. They're listening about two or three breaks per morning, two or three mornings per week, and each of those occasions is about seven minutes per time. What's the most important thing you can do to increase your ratings and get more average quarter hours? How can you use the audience you have listening right now to get one more occasion today and one more day per week? If you can get one more day per week, one more occasion per day, your ratings are going to double. You can do all of that with effective teasing. So what's more important, great content or great teasing? 
Well, with a great, great content may not be heard without a great tease because people don't know that it's coming. Now, you've got to have great content because if I get used to, that's a great tease, and I get there and the content's not worthwhile, I stop listening to you. I stop bothering. I catch on. You're clickbait. You're audio clickbait at that point. So great content is important, but great teases are at least as important, and I think more so. Upworthy, you're probably familiar with them. Upworthy is a uh, site that goes all, does what we do. They go all over the internet looking for uh, stories that they think are interesting, and then they curate it, they rewrite it, and they put it out under their own brand. Um, they do a lot of testing on their headlines, which their headlines are our teases, and they found that the best testing headlines have five times greater response in clicks than ordinary headlines. Now think if you were able to create five times the response from listeners for your teases as opposed to an average ordinary tease. So make your teases part of show prep. And section four, the last thing, the number one thing, and I'll leave you with this, the most important thing that you can do is don't eat listener food. <laughs> Fred? <laughs> uh, now, the most important thing you can do to take your show from good to great, and you can start doing this on Monday morning when you get back, and you can do it every single day, and you can do it in every single break, and you can do it in every email you send, every post that you put on social media, every time that you're out shaking hands with a listener at an event, every time you're at an appearance, is this one thing that's simple. You all do it every day in your ordinary life, and that's be you. You are the greatest advantage, and it's the one thing that nobody else has. It's you. And the one thing, uh, Fred's presentation this morning uh, from the research was fantastic. There was one thing that really has me concerned. It's that 57% of you said you're afraid that you're going to say something every day that's going to get you in trouble. That's terrifying for the radio industry. You've got to be yourself. So what I'd recommend is you figure out who you are on the air. What's your voice? What's your character? What's your character's voice? There's exercises that we can help you with for that. You develop a character profile, and then everything that you do on the air, you channel it through that profile. And you get your manager, you get your program director, you get every decision maker who has the potential of getting you in trouble or fired to sign off on that character profile and then never perform outside of it. So if you say something that's controversial or edgy or something that you get called into a meeting about or a listener complains or an advertiser has a problem with it, you can go back to the character profile and say, were you performing within the guidelines of how this character was conceived and developed? And if that's the case, it should settle the problem. Because you can't perform on the air if you're worried that you're going to get dragged into a meeting for something that you say. And the reason that a lot of shows and a lot of stations have become generic and dispensable is because you're afraid in your performance. You've got to be bulletproof when you go in the studio. You've got to go in there with confidence, knowing that if you do say something that's over the line, your program director, your general manager, your company has your back and has that support. And I think that's... That is terrifying that most of you think, or a large portion of you think, that you don't have the support from the corporate office, from your managers, and that you're worried that something you say is going to get you in trouble. So be yourself. Know your character. As you're doing that, embrace your quirks and flaws. Make yourself vulnerable and exaggerate those traits. A couple of weeks ago, Mike McVeigh and I did a session uh, on a webinar called Coaching the Coaches. And Mike reminded me and, and also the viewers of a scene from Bull Durham, which I think is terrific. And it's an example of how uh, Crash Davis, played by Kevin Costner, knew who he was and what he believed in, and he owned it. Do it. Oh, we're going to do it. <laughs> These are the ground rules. I hook up with one guy a season. Usually takes me a couple weeks to pick the guy. That's kind of my own spring training. Yeah, well, 
You two are the most promising prospects of the season so far. So I just thought we should kind of get to know each other. Time out. Why do you get to choose? What? Why do you get to choose? I mean, why don't I get to choose? Why doesn't he get to choose? Well, actually, nobody on this planet ever really chooses each other. I mean, it's all a question of quantum physics, molecular attraction, and timing. I mean, they're laws we don't understand that bring us together and tear us apart. I mean, it's like pheromones. You get three ants together, they can't do dick. You get 300 million of them, they can build a cathedral. <laughs> so is somebody going to go to bed with somebody or what? Honey, you are a regular nuclear meltdown. You better cool off. <laughs> Wait a minute, where are you going? After 12 years in the minor leagues, I don't try out. Besides, uh, I don't believe in quantum physics when it comes to matters of the heart. What do you believe in then? Well, I believe in the soul. The cock, the pussy, the small of a woman's back, the hanging curveball, high fiber, good scotch, that the novels of Susan Sontag are self-indulgent, overrated crap. I believe Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. I believe there ought to be a constitutional amendment outlawing AstroTurf and the designated hitter. I believe in the sweet spot, softcore pornography, opening your presents Christmas morning rather than Christmas Eve, and I believe in long, slow, deep, soft, wet kisses that last three days. Good night. Good night. Leave your listeners saying, oh my. It's how you win the girl. It's how you win the audience. He knows who he is, and he's bold, and he's proud of it. So know yourself, be yourself, and be bold when you go back on the air. If anybody has any questions, now be the time to make your way to the microphone. Uh, in review, quickly, number 10, make every break sparkle. Curate your content. Uh, don't just regurgitate your show prep, but curate the content. Ask yourself, what else can I do to make this stand out? Explain yourself as if you're talking to third graders. Stop being perfect. Strive for excellence. Be loose in performance, but tight in preparation. Be more efficient. Don't waste the listener's time, but take as much time as you need to make an impact. Go for calls, not just texts. Learn to tease. And number one, be yourself. If you would like this presentation, I've made it available. You can get it at tjohnsonmediagroup.com slash msbc. You can go there and download that anytime you like. There's my contact information if you would um, like to reach out to me at any time by uh, telephone, by text message, uh, or by uh, email. You can reach me by email through the website at tjohnsonmediagroup.com. Question. Okay, the question is, how do you know you've earned the right to, uh, to start taking the music off and get to know music? And how, how do you know when you're at that sweet spot? How do you know when you can do that? Well, it's, it's a process. I, I believe that every station should be researching. If you can't afford to do external research, a perceptual or a full market study, you can do surveys of your audience uh, through, and it can be very inexpensive, in some cases free. Um, and I would do it every quarter. Uh, get a benchmark, you know, what do you think of the show and, and have a, a list of questions that you're asking and then every quarter measure your progress and the goals that you've set against how you've, what, what you've done in the past and you can start to see when that happens, you can start to feel it in the market, ask your listeners all the time, pay attention to the feedback, pay attention to the little cues uh, that are happening, watch the ratings, ratings aren't the way that you can evaluate the quality of your show or when you're ready to start taking the music off but it's an indicator, it's one of the pieces of information that comes in um, but, and, then, and then don't do it suddenly, don't go from 10 songs an hour to 4 <laughs> um, there, there, there's, a, there's a whole process in, in, in removing the music. One of the, one of the things you might want to do is, in, is if you've got a two minute limit on breaks, maybe it's two and a half minutes. Then go to two and three quarters, then go to three minute breaks. And then uh, as you start to grow, that, that eliminates a song an hour. If you do four breaks an hour and you add a minute to each of the breaks, that replaces one song. 
And after you grow from there and you're starting to feel the feedback, then maybe you add a fourth or a fifth break to the hour. Well, that replaces another song. So you're doing this over a period of time. You're not doing it saying, well, we eventually want, you know, Tracy said that we eventually the goal is to get to know music. So let's take all the music off and figure out how to do it. That's, that, that's not what you, what you do. You're earning the right to do that with the audience, which is a process and it takes time. Okay. Yes. I'm Corey Dillon from uh, KFBG now in San Diego. I have Tracy as one of the people to thank for that because I attended many of his online seminars and, and um, upped my resume and my demo game. Um, but I'm one of the people now that is doing a solo morning show, which I think is it's happening more and more. Um, and, and I'm not bothered by the fact it's a more music morning show. I have four talk over music breaks because in this era of TikTok and reels where anything and everything can only be 30 seconds, you know, I, I don't, I'm not bothered by that. And I don't know that anybody else should be either, you know, I mean, who wants to talk to anybody for four minutes? I don't anymore. I don't want to read a post that's like a mile long. We just don't have that attention span anymore. So I wondered, you know, Tracy, if you've kind of done a deep dive into you know, how these music tastes are changing. I mean, it's, it's the opposite of what you were just saying. The goal maybe isn't to talk for four to 10 minutes at a time or to be an all talk show. You know, I, I don't know what kind of research you're seeing coming back or, or just, you know, observational or otherwise about how we really, you know, capture them and, and get them to, to like us enough to have a conversation with us. Thanks, Corey. Uh, by, by the way, Corey's on Big 100.7 in San Diego, and um, and if 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 you're a solo personality or you're doing an afternoon show or a music intensive show, stream Corey's show and what she's doing because you know, I, and I and I, I work with the cluster, and every time I see the management team there, I say you are not getting nearly enough value out of Corey. She is absolutely terrific. She pours. <laughs> no, seriously, she pours personality into every opportunity she has when that mic goes on, and it leaves you wanting to hear more of her. And um, yeah, I, I can't wait until that's loose, and so so that happens on that station. Corey's Corey's just sounding great, but it's it's a great question, and you know, at, at that station, and it may be your station strategy where you are too, where you're establishing a music presence and you're establishing a position in the market, and it's a strategic decision not to have high-profile personalities who are overshadowing the music or standing out. And if that's the case, that's great. I think the key in every one of these situations is the personalities and the management team get on the same page and you're connected on what the goal is. What is this personality supposed to be on this station and the strategy the station has? Because if you're not in sync with what the station wants for that show, it's not going to end well. And it's probably not going to end well for you. If you want to do a full show and the station just wants a talking head that makes the music sound better, and there, there's a disconnect there. And the opposite is also true. If you are a DJ who makes the station sound better and the station hires you because you've had good ratings doing afternoons and they put you on mornings and they think that you're going to raise the morning show up and you're going to be the star of the, of, of the station, they're going to be disappointed. So it's really important to know what position that you hold and what you're for and what's expected of you. And that gets in sync. And, and that's what Corey just described. She understands that it's a music intensive station that's establishing a position. And over time, I really expect that to change. But know what that is on your station and what role that you play in it. Hi, uh, Kelly from the Kelly and Wood Show, St. Cloud, Minnesota. Uh, question I had about the shake their hand, don't punch them thing. I'm a little bit concerned because we worked really hard to, we're still in a diary market, so we want to make sure that everyone knows who they're listening to and everything. So I created like these one second sweepers that say Kelly and Wood, and then we just, boom, hit, with them, hit them with the hook right away. You're saying that's probably not what we should be doing. Because like, we'll be coming out of a song, it's boom, Kelly and Wood. Oh my God, your wife had a vibrator. Or whatever, whatever the topic is, like we just go right into it. That's actually happened on the show, our most downloaded podcast. But... Um, <laughs> 
I, I, so now I'm kind of concerned because even our consultant was like, this is great. You're just getting right to the meat well, and there's no, hey, we're the most music in the this and the all that. So uh, like, yeah. what, what's the balance there, I guess, is what it, I'm it asking. It is a balancing act, absolutely. You know, um, uh, I work with uh, both Caleb and Air One and um, Mandy Young is the, uh, the program director for uh, both stations. And we've been working hard on uh, shake their hand, don't punch them on the face with all of the shows that I work with there. And there's one show that went a little bit too far and was getting into the chit chat where it was taking 30 or 40 seconds for him to say good morning and how you doing and go on and on about the song. And we were on a call one day and Mandy said, hey, you know what? I want you to shake their hands, not put them up against the wall and start making out with them. <laughs> and, and so it is a balance. It's, it's a balance of connecting with the audience, acknowledge that environment, and making a transition, again, going back to that slide that I showed you about how you're transitioning from a background to foreground, how you make that transition and ease them into it and win the attention away from it. Um, and you know, as far as identifying the name of the show and the name of the station, um, and whether it's a diary market or a metered market, it is just as important, and I'll make the case that it's more important in a metered market to identify your station, your brand, your position, your name, because the more choices listeners have, the more tune-out you have every time something negative starts to happen. And they are very quick to push that button to turn it off, or they get a phone call, they get distracted, they stop it, you know, they, they go into a meeting, they stop into Starbucks, they're very distracted. What are you doing that's important enough for them to remember to come back and listen again? And if you're not branding your station, if you're not branding your show, if you're not reminding them of who you are, if you're not standing out, if you're not important enough for them to remember you, how are you going to get them back for that extra tune-in? And if you don't get them back for that extra tune-in, how are you going to make them fans? And fans are what it's all about. Developing fan, fan, a, a large fan base it's what gives you a lot of quarter hours. So that's the goal, is how do you get those fans? So identifying, and, and by the way, a quick sweeper that just says your name and right into content, that's really efficient, but does that stand out and does that print, does anybody hear it? Or does it just go by them so quickly that they weren't sure what that was? So make sure they hear it, talk to them like third graders. Make sure, explain who you are, make sure that it stands out. But don't indulge it so long, as long that it becomes chit-chat and they tune out, because then it just becomes noise. I'm Mark Elliott. Uh, I've been working with a lot of small market radio stations over the last couple of years, and I have continued to hear general managers complain about barter spots as they relate to prep and content. And I offer you a challenge, uh, and everybody else who writes columns and articles, to use the word curate, and to use that example, because that's what successful personalities are doing with show prep services. Yep. I know uh, there's you know, lots of people, none of them are in this room, who just rip off the you know, whatever's there and read it word for word. But the people who are taking it and curating it, that's a great word, Tracy, I wanted to, to applaud you for that, and to hope that everybody tells general managers and people who are complaining about the barter cost of prep that it is useful and can be curated and used to customize for each particular morning show. And a quick shout out to all the Facebook radio peeps here today. Uh, oh, I thought I'd get more than that. But thank you very much, Tracy. Th thanks, Mark. You know, um, curating that kind of, yeah, you know, if you're just ripping and reading uh, information from a show prep service, then cancel the show prep service and go get your information somewhere else. That's not what it's for. That's where it starts. It should, it's great to collate information, to get uh, idea starters, to see what someone else has done with their personality in their situation, on their station, for their show, with their audience. And if that can inspire an idea that leads you to something that's right for your station, on your show, for your personality, with your audience, that's fantastic. But don't do it just because um, Mercedes in the morning in Las Vegas did it and it worked for her. That doesn't mean it's going to work for you. It might and it might not. But you've got to curate that content and make it work for your show to make it stand out and be unique to your character, your personality brand. Because on the, the um, video I showed you from Bull Durham, what works for Nuke, Le Nuke Lelouch isn't going to work for Kevin Costner for Crash Davis. 
They're very different personalities. He could get up and give the same speech. It wouldn't come off the same way because that's not who he is. And that's not who you are. But you can be inspired by the content that other persons are doing. And you can use it as a tool, not as a template. Anyone else? Anything else? Yes. Art wants you to get on the microphone. Whole room full of air personalities and doesn't want to use the microphone. First of all, your presentation was great. This was Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Talk, to, talk about team chemistry. What are some important uh, assets to teams working together in correlation with success on the show? Uh, well, that's, a, that's a deep topic, and I'll just take a couple of seconds to make a couple of comments. Number one, it's, it's key. Chemistry is really, really important, but chemistry comes from a group of people with a common goal, and they all buy in to the concept that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, um, that it's all for one, that we're all in, uh, that we're all for it, whatever the best solution is. Um, it's not, team chemistry is not getting a group of people who never disagree. Chemistry usually comes about because we disagree. If you, if, you get a, if you get four people on a show or three people on a show or even two people on a show who are identical and there's no difference, you may get along great and you have a great time going out for coffee and you never argue with each other or yell at each other. You may never disagree, but you're not going to have a very good show. So it's not about agreeing or disagreeing or avoiding friction or conflict off the air. That's not chemistry. Chemistry is when you're better together than you are separately. And you figure out how to make it work. It's like a relationship. It's like being in a family. There's a lot of things about every one of your family members that you don't like. You don't like this about them. But you love them and you're a family. And the family doesn't get broken up. And it's the same with the show. And you've got to make that family-like commitment to the show that the show is preserved no matter what. And everything else is just details. Everything else can be worked out. If everybody's going in the same direction, they put the success of the show above the success of the individual, then every individual is going to benefit from that and is going to succeed as a result of that. Does that help? Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it very much. Enjoy the rest of the week.